Hello, 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 and thank you all for joining me for the fourth episode of Queening Out, EW's new Instagram live series, interviewing drag kings, queens, and queer performers of all kinds. I'm very excited to be back here. And um, unlike my guest today, I was not on Boston Public with Loretta Devine. Um, I'm Joey Nolfi, the Drag Race reporter at Entertainment Weekly, and you can find most of my coverage at EW.com slash Drag Race, um, part of which includes the iconic... EW's Binge Podcast, where alongside my co-host Jillian Cedarholm, we recap each season of Drag Race with help from the queens themselves. So the episode recapping season 10 just went live this morning on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, so check that out. And um, I was just informed today, actually, that the Library of Congress um, will include this podcast in the National Podcast Registry of Culturally Significant Shows, so you're welcome, history. Um, <laughs> everyone, I need you to get out your Jackson Maine breastplates, though. Um, for signing because on Queening Out today we have someone I've been a huge fan of for years but I've never had the opportunity to interview. Um, this prolific actor and drag artist has appeared on Nip Tuck, RuPaul's Drag Race, um, alongside Shangela and Lady Gaga in A Star Is Born, um, launched a makeup line called Suck Less, wrote a book of the same name, and received his first two Emmy nominations earlier this year for his work in makeup and acting on the Netflix series Eastsiders. So please welcome the legendary Willem. Hello. Oh my God, look at that. Yes, practicing safe mask wearing practices in this horrendous time we're in. I love this hair, natural, authentic hair. I thought you said you were putting on a wig. Yeah, no, I just straightened my own hair instead. Yeah, and put nice little ponytails on the top. It looks wonderful. The <laughs> West. <laughs> well, how are you? How are you doing? It's so great to have you here. Fantastic. You're fantastic. Good. I must apologize. Um, this interview is way overdue. Um, I, I feel like we should have done this many times over, but I'm so glad that we're finally doing it. And I genuinely appreciate you coming on today. No, I said drag is magic, like Nina West. Oh, dra <laughs> I love Nina. I hope she's watching. <laughs> No, I was just telling everybody that I have loved your career over the years. Um, so it really meant a lot to me when I heard that you had shouted out um, EW's Binge podcast on Race Chaser. I was very touched that you uh, did that on your own volition. So um, thank you so much. And it's funny because when we decided to do Drag Race as the next season, because um, that podcast has been around for a while, um, I told everybody like, no, Alaska and Willem read everybody if they're not drag queens doing a podcast on drag queens. So we have to bring the girls in to actually do this with us. So you were like our spiritual guide this whole time. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for doing that and like respecting drag like that. <laughs> Yeah, of course. No, I thought it was really important. I mean, I wouldn't want to, I mean, I'm, I've never done, well, I did drag for like a photo one time, but I'm not like an expert on, on you know, the art at, of it at all. So I thought it was really important to have the girls on to actually speak to the experience. And it was funny because when Latrice and Chad were on, they both said, had absolutely wonderful things to say about you. Um, Latrice actually said that of all the girls, she knows that when shit gets really bad in her life, that she can call you and that you will have her back for anything. Um, and part of that bond, she said, is like fostered over time by you sending her really strange things in the mail, like uh -huh. sex toys. Like why are you sending sex toys to people in the mail? <laughs> well, I, when you find a wig and you're like, this ain't right for me, but it's right for my sister, you put it in the mail. Mm -hmm. And then there was, there was something we, I think I rolled it up and then put it in a poster. So like Latrice was like, what the fuck are you sending me, bitch? Like pipe bombs or something. <laughs> No, oh, just like, and then I I had like some stuff I wanted to send Chad, and I did the same thing. Like I mm -hmm. I like just surprising people and trying to make their day a little brighter. Mm -hmm. Um, and Latrice has made my day brighter a lot. Usually it starts with a lighter, and then we <laughs> smoke it, and then the day is so much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who could argue with that? <laughs> what is what is who is on your mask right now? This is me. Oh, that's you. Uh huh. It's available at Drag Queen merch. Oh wait. Okay. I'd like to keep it on, please. Oh my God! A mask reveal. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to 2020. What's your dream? <laughs> oh, this is so great. I love it. Where is that yours too? Is that from your your line of masks? No, my friend Howie made it. Mm -hmm. uh, he made Ariana's outfit for the VMAs and Lizzo's outfits last year. He makes outfits for all the girls and all the girls. <laughs> What's his at? It's uh, Mr. Underscore Howie. And he made okay. with it. Oh, yeah. That's and really cute. 
skirt, which I don't have on because I am a man. <laughs> uh oh, this foundation's cracking, I think. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> what? Oh. Talking to the wigs again? We doing another reveal? No, we fit. Okay. okay. Fine. It looks, I thought you were putting your mask back on. <laughs> off. No, I do want to um, I want to talk to you a little bit about your uh, current projects, but there's one thing that I've been looking forward to that I want to talk to you that I haven't heard anything about in a while on this Quibi series that you had in the works. Can you give us like an update on what's going on with that? On the what? The Quibi series. Willem. Oh, hello. Hello, we just stopped to do some casual reading. Yeah, it's a good book. There's always something to sh to. <laughs> like, who wouldn't lose their bowels looking at that? No, I mean, I, you know, I think Trixie was very proud of the fellows in that, in that book, so. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So did you, did you want, was that something that I should not ask about? Do you want me to not I ask didn't, about? But what happened? The Quibi series? I was going to ask you about the, an update on the Quibi series. Well, it was a show about like daily fashion and stuff, and there, mm -hmm. there's not any daily fashion to talk about. So right, right now, it's not something that would really make sense on the air, I don't think. So um, I really don't under, I don't know everything that's going on, but uh, I would love, and if, <laughs> I mean, look at my eyes, they're going this way, this way, this way. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, I can't talk about Deborah Burks' scarfs every day. Right. Or like the tie <laughs> yeah. Dr. Fauci's wearing. <laughs> That could be an interesting concept, though, the fashions of the people who are helping to fight coronavirus. Yeah, for for one episode. Right. <laughs> um, well, I hope to see something along uh, those lines from you in the future. I was looking forward to that. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can see something. Uh, and one thing, though, that I have loved about you um, that you've done in quarantine is kept up with all of these digital projects and the, the content that you've always done um, on so many different formats, like Beat Down, Race Chaser, Craft or Noonting. Like, we saw a lot of drag artists, I think, at the start of quarantine sort of struggling to adapt to this like fully digital way of life. Um, so, but I mean, you've been doing this stuff for years. So was that a conscious decision on your part years ago to sort of um, lay the foundation for being a digital drag artist in the same way that you also focused on like your live career? First of all, I'm not wearing foundation. <laughs> Spoiler. Uh, that, no, I, I, there was not a conscious decision. I just always knew that if I could spend my time making a video that could reach 100,000 people, that might be a better effort than doing a show that might reach, you know, 300 sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm in LA, I'm trying to make videos. If I'm on the road, I'm usually not. And I love being on the road. So I concentrate on that. But I think YouTube has always been my go to spot where I put stuff that like, maybe I can't do on stage, or I want to wear an outfit that like, mm -hmm. I can't perform in because I have to do a reveal because I don't know how to dance. So I got to take some clothes off to make people go, Ooh, look what she did. <laughs> uh, so basically, I've been using YouTube for years. So it, it does feel nice that I had that in place when everybody was trying to adapt. Um, but I think a lot of the girls have done really, really well. Yeah. And if anybody asks me for help, I always tell them like, this is the microphone. This is what you need lighting wise, minimum. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the girls need a lot more. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm lucky in my predicament, but um, you know, we're all feeling it in some way or another. I'm just trying to keep a, keep a cute face on for everybody. Filled with suckless face and body. <laughs> Well, I mean, because you are a, it, it's so fascinating to me to see that you are such a well-rounded business person. I mean, you have so much going on in so many different areas. So was that like how you, did you sort of set out at the beginning of your career thinking that you wanted to become this sort of brand as a drag artist? Or was it more about acting for you in, in the beginning and then you sort of adapted as you went? Um, I kind of always wanted to be like an actor and then I decided on like some kind of type of mishmash of like Martha Stewart and Chris Hardwick. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've always wanted like, uh, I've always wanted to own a hotel, uh, strip club. I don't know what's going on next. I don't plan anything. I just like, you know, if there's a red light on, I'm gonna cheat to camera and then like hopefully something funny will come out. But mm -hmm. I'm always trying to m entertain and like make 
spaces where people can entertain. I'm working on a Palm Springs house right now. That's going to be like an Airbnb, like Drag Palace and all that. Oh. Um, and that'll be open October 1st. So after that, it'll be another new project. But I don't really like consciously go, oh, I'm going to make videos and like dominate this quarantine because, you know, I'm not. Girl, this brow though, too. That brow. <laughs> You're obsessed with this face right now. Yes. Oh, my God. Well, I'm beautiful. Yes, of course. Somebody's in the comments saying that you should be president. So is that um, on the table, too? Uh, maybe under the table. <laughs> well, uh, craft your noonting. I want to talk about that. That is so wild. I love that you've made... Let me see here. I listed some things that you made. Vegan taxidermy with a Miss Piggy head. Um, a sunglasses rack for your ceiling. I love the Spice Girls rack. Is that still functional? Yeah, it's great. And it didn't melt. So all those people can fuck themselves. <laughs> so it's still up and functional. Uh, on that episode, I saw that there were pennies on your kitchen wall too, um, which is a design choice I don't think I've seen in a kitchen before. Is there a story as to why you wanted to do pennies on your, your kitchen wall? Yeah, I, I was inspired by like the new Drag Race girls. Like, you know... Claire St. Clair, and they just put their money where you could see it, right in their face. So I was like, <laughs> okay, let me put my money where I can see it, on my wall. Because there's no more room. So, uh, do you want to see the pennies? I can show you. Yeah, yeah, can we see them? Okay. Come on, bitch. Let's go. It's like cribs. cribs so this is my record different. wall. I have Trixie Aww. and Madonna, the village people. Icons only. Sylvester and Gaga. Gaga. Um, we got RuPaul. We got Whitney Houston. Oh, and I then love here's, that. Thanks. And then there's the pennies over there. Yes, yeah, pennies. Does it, does you have to do, because like pennies always have a very strong copper smell. Did you have to do anything to the pennies so that your whole kitchen wouldn't smell like that? No. No? No, my hands were dirty, but pennies aren't made from that much copper anymore. It's mostly something else. Mm. And uh, like some kind of coating, I think. I didn't know that. I You're know, educating I, just, I don't know. You're always educating people. I didn't know that. Uh-huh. Um, so where did you get the pennies? Was it just like your own money that you just went to a bank and were like, I need a million pennies? No, girl, tips. Tips? You People yeah. tip you in pennies? Sometimes when the show's bad. <laughs> oh my God, that's a lot of bad shows with all those pennies. Like somebody sends me a roll in January every year and says, well, these are for your next batch of shows. A <laughs> hundred shows, a penny for each, you make a dollar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I think you're ability as a comedic actor it comes through um so strong in these videos like craft or noonting and all the things that you do online um but you are a very accomplished actor uh in scripted projects like before drag race you were on nip tuck i mean cherry peck was obviously a very interesting character i remember watching that when i was younger um but looking at your early filmography it was interesting to me because i see characters described by words like you know, bus stop drag queen or butch queen or transsexual, but you've since played like more well-rounded characters, I think, um, like East Siders and A Star is Born. So from an actor's perspective, how do you think, have you noticed like a switch in both opportunity itself and the types of roles available to drag performers and how that is evolving and changing over the years? Well, stupid straight men will always write what they think they know about us. And a right. lot of them know a trans person or a gay person. So they tend to write stereotypes sometimes. Um, I just did Kaminsky Method and I was playing a hooker who was, they didn't describe what her her gender identity was or anything, but I've been a hooker. I've been a drag queen. So I was like, I can play this role, but someone else went in for it, booked it. And then they said, I don't want to do it. This is not the representation that should be in the media. And I kind of ag agree, but I was like, I need the work and I'm going to take it. So that's how I got my job on the Kaminsky method. Um, the actor who tried to, you know, tell them this is the language they should use for the character or why it was wrong, he was right. But mm -hmm. uh, he didn't want to do it. I did it and was happy to because, you know, I felt okay playing that. If you don't feel okay playing a role, you shouldn't play it. The roles that I played mostly earlier in my career, I wouldn't play anymore um, mm -hmm. because, you know, Ryan Murphy told me he's like the best person got, the best actor got the job when I got Cherry because like I had been in like three or four times before that for other roles on Nip Tuck. I didn't get it. But then he saw me as an extra on his set for something. And he talked to me about like a book I was reading. Uh, it was a Janice Dickinson book. And he's like, oh. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he told me after I got Cherry, he's like, you were really, really close on a couple of other things. And I was like, oh, wow. So like, 
I just go in for the work. And you say accomplish, I'm not accomplished. Nobody says my name right. Um, I couldn't even get invited to the Oscars. Uh, I'm just happy to be working at this point. But accomplished is a big word for what I've done. I think though, I think that you, you I, I'm coming from it in terms of like, you know, I look at you and I think I see somebody who does represent excellence. I mean, I know that we're always as like as a writer, I'm very hard on myself when I look at my own writing and I and I hesitate to hesitate to call myself accomplished too. But I think that you do represent for a lot of people excellence in this community and all that you have done. So I do think you're accomplished. Um, I think that, you know, ha you've got gotten to be in a blockbuster film that was nominated for Best Picture with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. I mean, that is that's a huge accomplishment, I think. And Shangela. And Shangela, yes, the lovely Shangela. And I actually do want to talk to you about um, A Star is Born. Uh, it, it's interesting because I think this goes back to what I was maybe talking about before in terms of the evolution of, you know, drag characters in film and TV, because you guys are essentially Gaga's like drag mothers almost. Like you represented where she came from, her flair for being a showgirl, and then you sort of come back in towards the end of the film on that little FaceTime call. And it's like, okay, this is a reminder of where she comes from. And I thought it was a really uh, honest and heartfelt way to sort of weave the drag community into this film. Um, so you also got, you guys were really funny in that, in that movie. Um, and in a way that felt like you were controlling the comedy instead of, you know, being the butt of a joke. Um, like we do see a lot of drag performers in mainstream projects. So what did it feel like to you getting a part in a mainstream blockbuster <laughs> film like that. Um, Sorry, I saw my friends. Oh, it's okay, it's all right. Um, what did it feel like to you getting a part in a mainstream blockbuster film like that uh, in that capacity where what it maybe didn't feel like a, a joke? Um, well, I had no idea until I was there that it wasn't gonna be anything but the script. Mm -hmm. And um, when we did get there, Bradley kind of let, Shangela and the girls and I like do our thing. We found out we weren't reading, we weren't saying the lines that we had memorized in the script when they said rehearsal. And they were just, no, just do whatever. And we were like, so the script, they're like, nah. Um, <laughs> so getting the part was great, but then a week into it, I lost the part because they cut all the scenes. Mm. And then like four or five days later, they called to check my avail again. And I was like, yes, I'm available. Uh, of course, duh. And mm -hmm. I didn't expect anything to come of it, but we went, the first day went good. Second day, they added a scene for Shangela and I with the guitar. And, um, you know, you just hope that they'll like one of your jokes and put it in or something, and they did. So, win-win. And the party was fun. The, the what? The parties. Oh yeah, I actually, I sat behind you at the premiere in Toronto. I was too nervous to say hi to you, but it was just like cool to see like you just sitting there in this theater watching this movie for the first time. It was really cool. Um, but so you initially had rehearsed something different than what was eventually on screen or you actually filmed something and they got cut? No, they cut my part before it actually, we actually worked. Okay. Like, did the, we did the fitting and like, uh, the, I was going through wardrobe and all that stuff, and then they cut it all. Um, mm. Yeah, so that happened. Because <laughs> I know that you, so because you obviously had association with Gaga prior because of the lyric video for Applause. Did she have something, do you think, personally to do with sort of bringing you and Shangela back into the fold or into the fold in the first place? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know, but I just know that I'm, I, everybody was laughing and liking it during rehearsal. Mm -hmm. uh, Gaga told me to switch two of my jokes around because she said that's how Bradley liked it. Um, but <laughs> very supportive. Somebody was rubbing my shoulder. I've told this story, but like someone was rubbing my shoulders at one point and I turned around and it was her. And I was like, <laughs> air watch. And, um, she, she was just really, really cool. I forget the question. When I talk about Gaga, I just go on tangents because I love her so much. But um, yeah, I don't remember. Oh, how that's like that, you answered it. That was fine. Um, what, do you, what do you think is the, the wildest story or, or like the most memorable thing that you remember from that set? Um, the food was good. Lunch was <laughs> good. Uh, it, it was Bradley singing like the songs all, oh, you know what? On the second day at lunch, they showed us the first 25 minutes of the film. Mm -hmm. And then after they showed it to us. They were like, nobody had their phones out, did they? I was like, nobody wanted to check. It was so good. It was the whole movie up until 
the parking lot, they, they did the parking lot scene and then it ended and it didn't have the drag scenes in there yet. But like just seeing what Bradley and Gaga and like everybody was doing and knowing that what we were making that day and how it fit, it was like, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it was, it was an amazing, it was probably the best set I've ever been on. Like it was mm -hmm. so much fun and like, you could tell what was happening. All the singing was live. Like, you know, it's, it was, it was staggering to have had that opportunity. Oh, I remember you said the lyric video. I did not have an association <laughs> with Gaga. The lyric video, I ended up in it for a second because I was returning a wig or I was getting a wig that Morgan borrowed from me. So I had to get it back and I'm going up the back stairs of Mickey's and sh she's coming up the front stairs. I was like, oh, Joe Judas Mason looks good today. And then I was like, wait, oh, that, that is Gaga because it wasn't the Gaga impersonator I thought it was. And then Morgan and I were just chilling with her alone in the room. And then she, we're talking out of the blue. She says, do you want a picture? And I was like, I didn't want to be that girl, but if you're offering, sure. Yeah. And we look lovely. Um, but Bradley was responsible for me being in the movie. She, uh, and the way I look at it, Shangela was requested by Gaga's team to audition mm. to be a part of it. But Ga yeah, Gaga didn't know me from Adam really, but she does have the memory of a elephant i took raya my best friend to her to the rap party and she looked at her i was like raya this is gaga uh, or and gaga went like this sit back and went tiger heat and she named the club that raya showed her a gaga tattoo at because it was the first tattoo gaga had ever seen wow. of someone in like 2009 mm -hmm. and she remembered raya because she was like wow. crying and everything and like it was just like really a nice moment seeing like how much she really does love her fans it's not She's that person. She has this massive brain that can remember names and people. And like, even if she doesn't, she still, she makes you feel so damn good every time. Just like, you know, she's, she's not just like talking to talk about us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You hear that a lot from people that have worked with her and people that know her is that it's, a, it's very genuine. So I'm really glad that you had that experience with her. Um, now for your acting, I, I, you know, you've done such interesting work recently. Um, you were nominated for an Emmy this year for your part in East Siders, both acting and also in the makeup department, which is huge. Um, and I know that you've been at this for a long time, so it was really great to see you recognized this year. Um, but what did it feel like to you for, uh, you know, after years of working as an actor to finally get this sort of recognition? Um, well, I still don't have an agent. <laughs> uh, really? no one, yeah, no one will represent me for theatrical work. I couldn't, I still can't find one. Even after Star is Born, I, um, I ran into Alyssa Milano on the Star is Born carpet and she introduced me to her husband. He's like, I, I work with Bradley. I was like, oh, cool. What do you do? Said, I'm an agent. And I was like, oh, I want one of them after this movie. And he went, good luck. I was like, like, it's, I, I can't what? after being funny in a movie, but like, I'll just go on auditions whenever anyone sends me. I don't, I don't expect much from Hollywood at this point. Um, so I'm just trying to make my own breaks, but getting the nomination was, it was kind of nice. But at the same time, like, it's not about that. It's about the work and like, just knowing I'm Emmy nominated is cool, but like, I'd rather have an agent. Yeah, that is like, that that is really shocking to me that that you don't have an agent, especially I mean, like I said, that film was nominated for Best Picture. I remember at the premiere in Toronto, when I'm sitting behind you and um, that when you and Shangela came on screen, that audience like erupted it was they were so excited to see you and they were laughing and hanging on to every word that you guys did so i mean it, it really is surprising to me that that you don't have an agent i mean we have to put that out there like if there are any agents in the people who are watching please work with willow if there are any agents on instagram at 11 30 in the morning they're not doing a <laughs> job right now so call me right <laughs> There is, I mean, I guess maybe this next question, I don't know how I was expecting maybe the next question to go one way, but maybe it'll go another after hearing that. Because there is a lot of, I think, if you look at the Emmy nominations this year, there are a lot of drag related projects nominated. I mean, of course, Drag Race yeah. got a lot of, oh wait, Willem? Nominated. Yeah, We're Here's nominated and right. uh, Glow's nominated, which is basically drag. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> Raven's not well oh it is I like I, I hung out with some of the glow girls because I'm friends with them from years ago and I just did a movie with Mariana Palco who's like a director on it and one of the actresses 
And she was telling me that um, Betty Gilpin, like when I met her at the SAG Awards, she told me too, she's like in the makeup trailer, she's like more Willem, like cause she's blonde <laughs> and wears blue eyeshadow and stuff. Like they look, they look at the girls. And so that was really cool to see them nominated. They're nominated for stunts too. Cause their stunt work is amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Raven's nominated. Uh, Zaldi's probably nominated. Uh, yeah. Uh, Curtis William, who does Rue's Wigs now, is nominated. Delta already won last mm -hmm. year. Props for the Shout queen. out to Delta, yes. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of drag is being noticed, which is nice. Legendary, I'm sure, will be nominated next year. Um, Absolutely. So it's nice to see Ballroom getting its due, too, because basically everything good in drag is stolen from Ballroom. It's from Ballroom, yeah. So do you think that, that seeing it at that level... Uh, being recognized by something like the Television Academy. Do you think that that signals some sort of a change in like shifting attitudes toward drag and queer performers on mainstream platforms? You know what? All, all I think it kind of signifies is that people are ready to jump on the bandwagon of what's hot. Mm -hmm. I've had so many generals where people are like, so we just wanted to talk to you and get your ideas and see what's up. And I'm like, you just want me to tell you my ideas. And then if you like them, you'll make them type of thing. Like, I, I get that, but like, you don't even know what you want. You just want something drag. And I'm like, it's nice to see that people are into it. Um, yeah, period. But I'm not, I'm not 100% that, uh, that everybody that makes a drag, like there's so many people out here that are just like, oh, I'm a, I review drag race now. And it's like, well, do you, why? You know, mm -hmm. so, some of them, it's just like, I, I should stop talking about this before I say something that I don't want to say, but like, it's, 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 it's good that there's eyes on it. I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you think though that it's still like when you're saying that you have generals of people that are asking for your opinion, is it more like a, they're, they're bringing you on as like a consulting producer and that's the idea or they're literally just like taking your ideas? That's happened so many times where like I've auditioned for something and then they're like, oh, will you, um, will you advise or teach this person how to do drag or get them up in it? And those I've said no to consistently because anytime they cast a straight person instead of like a drag queen, I'm like, I will not help. I, yeah. I do like it. I, I, I get it. Like I, I could, but just cast a drag queen. There's enough of us that some straight guy who wants to have a ward bait and who wants to like get some recognition, like, Oh, you're so brave and blah, blah, blah. Like, Matt Bomer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then maybe like, I mean, it's like all a big circle. Like when you hire an actual drag performer that gets the visibility out there, that gets you a damn agent because we need to get you an agent. That's just like, it's crazy to me that people are so willing to sort of work with drag performers and use their ideas and do projects like that, but then not actually bring them into the conversation in a proper way. I'm really sorry that that's happening. Well, that's why people need to make their own breaks and like build their own tables when they aren't invited to ones that already exist mm -hmm. and you're doing that i mean you really are like i said the career that you're building is really impressive i've watched it for you because i really do love everything that you do and you, another thing that i really like that you do is you're very vocal and sort of changing this community for the better through um i know you do a lot of fundraising with various organizations especially for the girls which you just did a race chaser um event for so can you tell me a little bit about that specific organization why you chose um, that one, and also why it's so important for you to do charity as a community figure like this? Um, well, I'm a horrible person, and I've been horrible for a very long time now. <laughs> so I'm trying to, um, A, get more points in the positive column than the negative column. And um, I think it's just important to stay active and do stuff when you don't have anything to do. Like, anytime I, I think to myself, I'm bored, it's like, that's privilege. You're bored because, like, you you're not struggling enough right now and then i'm like do more if if like the glitz the glitz charity and for the girls and just raising money for people that need it most i mean black trans women of color are under attack every day right um, and i realize stuff i'm like oh this country's going to hell and then i'm like you know what this country's been in hell for most of these people and i just didn't know because i'm a privileged white skank who lives in hollywood like i don't know these things um, and now learning them, I get mad at myself. And then I'm like, just chill. Everybody learns and grows at their own pace and just try to do as much as you can. And if you don't know what you're doing, look at other people and then just like regurgitate the information. And then hopefully other people will get it too and do the same. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just 
throwing a bunch of shit on a wall and hoping it sticks the spelling bee and like name that tune that was just out of ideas with me in alaska around and then we're like well we made money that for we've made over like fifty thousand dollars for charities in like two months and doing that feels like feels like a step in the right direction mm -hmm. i i don't feel like an example i don't feel like a hero swooping in or anything like that like we're just trying to get this back to zero for the people that are being you know marginalized yeah no it's important to do that and i think that i'm glad that you mentioned glitz too i really love that organization and it was great to see that they raised so much money yeah. to actually like meet their goals that was crazy i was so happy to see that um and i feel like though it's like you know looking at people through history this community knows people like obviously Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, but I feel almost like that older school of drag in past decades was focused on activism in a way that a lot of like mainstream drag is not or forgetting these days. Um, like, do you think it's possible or even like appropriate for a drag queen in 2020 to remain apolitical? Is that possible right now? Um, yeah, it's possible, but um... I don't know why anybody would want to remain apolitical. I mean, mm -hmm. other than alienating their audience, maybe, but like, yeah, drag, drag queens put on drag for attention. So usually, or to get attention for their art. So for them to not want attention for that part of their life, I don't, I don't know. I, you can separate art from artists a lot, but like, if I find out that someone is like a Trumper, like, no. And I don't know many drag queens that are, other than that Lady Maga piece of I'm shit. thinking of her, yeah. Oh my god, and that's so... Rebel. That <sighs> That's so crazy. I mean, and to use, like, of all people, Lady Gaga's name to do your little Trump riff on, like, come on. Like, <laughs> it's just, you're just asking to anger people, like, with this. It's just, it's pure, it seems like pure provocation. It doesn't seem like it's actually, like, it's just silliness. All I see is messy man. <laughs> Yes. Oh, I think I saw Heidi in the comments too. Heidi is saying hello to, to you. Um, yes, yes, she was just in here, I think. She was just saying hello. And Mayhem was in here as well. So they were saying hello. Um, two lovely girls. Um, now, I think all these things out here, though. What? I was saying hi to May May. Oh, okay. It's not for everybody. <laughs> I think that all the queens out here can probably just look to um, Derek Barry for guidance on how to live, you know, uh, fully in their community awareness, because thanks to him, every year we reflect very strongly on the deaths at Stonewall with that video that you are also in. Yeah, um, I think that every time that comes up, it's a learning opportunity for, for younger people and other people, because, like, a lot of people still know about Sylvia and Marsha, but, like, what about Stormy? Like, what about the other mm. people? Mm -hmm. um and i'm not trying to get in particulars about who was there and everything but like just like you you got to know every part of that story it's important it's like kind i know it wasn't the first one but it was one of the major birthrights uh birthplaces for our civil rights and the battle that we're still dealing with now so i think it's important to know the details and to like learn them once get them up there so you can be an educated homosexual and know that why you're allowed to be dancing to Christine W at 4 a.m. at Mickey's, you know? Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I'm, I, you, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you came from and all that stuff and um, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, no. I think I know that, that Derek has a good sense of humor about that situation too. So I think it is a good thing that it happened because I do think you sort of, when you came back at that, you sort of jolted a lot of people into their own um, unawareness. Um, but what happened that day when the camera stopped rolling. Did you guys like talk about that moment any further? Because you seemed a little bit shocked, I think, in the moment. No, I have this way of, of appearing more blasé than I usually am. Um, but Derek and I have been friends for years. He was my understudy in a show in 2011 that was going on in New York while I was filming Drag Race. And then I left Drag Race to go do this, finish a show in New York for the Fringe Festival and I remember him then and he was just very wide eyed and like, just happy to be there. And that's pretty much him. Um, mm -hmm. uh, does he say stupid shit? Yeah. Is some <laughs> of it funny? Yeah. Um, he's, he's my sister and like, you know, family's not always perfect, but I'm glad I could help him learn a little bit. And it was kind of an iconic moment, I guess.
very iconic. I mean, it's still every year on the anniversary of the Stonewall riots. It is uh, <laughs> that video comes up again and goes viral on somebody's Twitter. So yes, uh, for years to come, I think we will still be seeing that. <laughs> now, um, Willem, I think we've reached the end of our time. Um, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do in the community and for the great work that you do as an entertainer, um, entertaining us while you do it. Look at this glitter. Is that from your line? Is that your glitter from Suck Less? Oh, I didn't even know that you could see that. I'm sorry. Yes, this is from my line, <laughs> Suck Less Face and Body. <laughs> yes, I was just looking at all of the, uh, the stuff. Those, I love the, um, the eyelashes with the dots on them. Yeah, they're called Party Girl. They're named after my friend Raya. I love them, yes. Oh, I think she just followed me the other day. So shout out to Rhea. Um, wrong button. <laughs> oh, well you did it too. So you pushed the wrong button too. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for being here. Is there anything else um, or upcoming projects or anything that you wanna um, point our, our audience to right now? Um, yeah, listen to my podcast, Hot Goss mm -hmm. with Alaska and Race Chaser. And um, what else? I have a YouTube channel. There's two new videos a week. And right now on my Patreon, I'm, fi I'm finishing up uh, master classing with RuPaul. You learn so much stuff. Like you should never put your hands in your pockets. That means you're not trustworthy. Oh my RuPaul God. Back, so it's true. You saved that right for the end. Oh my God. <laughs> well, thank you to everybody for joining in for another episode of Queening Out. Um, please go onto Willem's YouTube channel for uh, new craft noon dings, beat downs. All seasons of East Siders are now on Netflix. Um, and Willem's Race Chaser podcast with Alaska airs weekly. You guys have always given coverage to drag queens, even if it's just on the little bullseye in the back. And like, you guys were there in season four helping this show become what it's become. And um, you supported it from the beginning. And I know there's a lots of fags and lesbians and whoever there that love us. So thank you, EW. Even though y'all went monthly now and I'm not getting my weekly fix. <laughs> well, you can get, it's every day, 24 seven online. So that can be your, your fix. <laughs> Well, thank you for saying that. It really do. Like, I mean, it, it seems like Drag Race and drag is, is like a full time beat for me now. So thank you very much for saying that. Um, and everybody, please join me back here next Thursday at two o'clock p.m. Eastern on Entertainment Weekly's Instagram Live, where I will be joined by the first Canada's Drag Race winner. Um, so tune in tonight at 9 p.m. to see who that is. Um, thank you so much, Willem. I really enjoyed this. And I hope I get to talk to you again soon. Jimbo was robbed. Jimbo was robbed. Absolutely. Thank <laughs> <laughs>